Hello, my name is James Cooper, and this is our testimony. In uh, 1992, I don't know, I, I, I didn't grow up knowing the Lord. I, I didn't go to church, and I actually lived a pretty bad life. Uh, did a lot of things wrong, but I also lived through a lot of bad things done to me. And uh, in 1992, when I was 23 years old, I was in a car crash, and I crushed my back from my hips all the way up through my neck. I crushed the nerves, the ligaments, the tendons, the soft tissue. I had degenerative disc disease. I had arthritis. I spent the first year in a back brace and neck brace. I spent the next uh, 10 years crippled for life in and out of hospitals. I was in so much pain that um, it was level 10 pain. It was like being on fire. That's the best way I can describe it. It felt like I was on fire. And I would, um, on heavy medications, they could only get me to sleep about two or three hours at a time. Then I would be awake for up to four or five days straight. Then I would sleep for two or three hours and I'd be awake for several days and I'd sleep for two or three hours and be awake for days. That's how I lived for ten years. Um, I had uh, multiple suicide attempts over twenty, trying to make the pain stop, trying to just make it stop. And um, I've done everything. I've overdosed. I've cut my throat. You know, nothing worked. I had. Um, uh, more than one time I've actually died. They brought me back with paddles once. Um, anyway, I was getting pretty desperate. It was towards kind of where I was really freaking out about not being able to die because when it's that bad and you need to die to make the pain stop, at least that's what you think. Um, I didn't understand why it wasn't working. But uh, my, my attempts uh, were not um, cries for help. All my problems have been addressed already. I was just trying to deal with the situation. Anyways, in July of 2001, my wife begged me to go to the Mayo Clinic. She said, well, it's the Mayo Clinic. Maybe they could help you. I knew they couldn't. We'd been through all that, but I decided to go. And uh, they um, put me through a lot of testing and came to the conclusion that there was nothing that could be done for me. One of the recommendations that the hospital made was to put me on heroin for the rest of my life. Um, I was already taking, you know, 4,000 milligrams a day of Vicodin, must relaxers, antidepressants, and pot. And the doctors had told me that that was what I should take. And to that, now they were going to add heroin. And I said no. I said I don't want to do that. Kurt Cobain did that. And he, uh, he died. He had uh, some medical issues he was taking heroin for. It didn't work. So I refused it and we asked him instead if they could just cut my spinal cord. And they said, um, we can't cut your spinal cord. It's, it's not legal. I said, well, if you just cut it at my neck, then at least my head would live. Because why is this not working out, you know? And they said they couldn't and I said, well, I'm not going to make it. And they said, how come you're still alive? It's really rare that someone would have lived as long as you have in this condition. It's a rare situation. And I said, well, I don't know. I've tried over and over to kill myself. I don't seem to die. I don't really understand what's happening. Uh, I have a theory. My theory is that I already killed myself. I think it's possible that, that one of my suicides worked and that I'm in hell because it feels like I'm on fire and it never stops. I uh, don't sleep and I feel like I'm burning. And I said, could you convince me that I'm not in hell? And one of the doctors started crying. Said if I was a dog or a horse, you'd shoot me, huh? And uh, they just looked at me. Anyways, I said, well, thanks for your help. Thanks for trying. And they asked me to film a interview to document my case. They said it was really rare for someone to have lived as long as I had. And I know things about pain that other people don't know, that doctors don't know. I know stuff that people shouldn't know, you know. I developed a section of my brain from here to here that its entire job was to take pain. That's what I told it to do. So it was like a callus, a section of my brain across the top of my head. I'd use the front and back of my brain to distract myself and try to do math and art and stuff, you know, but my well, was just a mess, you know. <laughs> Anyways, um, they filmed the, the interview with me on July 11th, 2001. And during the interview, they said, tomorrow's your birthday, July 12th. And I said, yeah, I turned 32. I'll never turn 33. It's not going to happen. And they let me out of the hospital. 
It was a 45 minute interview. I filmed it. I figured this is what I live for. I, I discovered things about pain and <laughs> pain management. Now I can die. And I went home and, and uh, my next suicide, I was in a hospital emergency room. They brought my family in to say goodbye to me. I was laying on the table having spasms and, and uh, I started floating out of my body. And it really scared me, you know. I, I didn't really understand what was going on. It felt really strange, you know. And I just kept watching the nurse doing her job. I'd go out of my body and I'd come back into my body. And I'd go out of my body and I'd come back into my body. And just kind of set up from my waist. And I was still half in my body. And I'd kind of jerk and come back in and start floating out again. And I said to the nurse, I said, I'm scared. And she said, you should be. You're probably going to die. We can't even do anything except wait and try to resuscitate you. Well, I didn't die. I didn't even fall asleep. I took 60 sleeping pills plus a bunch of other stuff, and I uh, was awake in intensive care for three days. You know, and the next suicide, I cut my throat. I cut it twice, and I still didn't die. I was going into a hospital on a weekend pass. Uh, I'd seen a preacher on TV, and I thought, um, "Man, I don't, I don't want to watch this." I'm pretty sure Jesus hates me. I believe in him and everything, but I'm pretty sure he hates me. And um, I told my wife, I said, I think I want to go to that, that church. And she said, watch, you just cut your throat, you know. <laughs> I said, yeah, it does sound kind of funny. <laughs> anyway, I ended up going there. And um, a weekend passed in the hospital that I was living in. Back then, they said I could never sit or stand more than 30 minutes or lift more than five pounds for the rest of my life. I was on crutches that attached to my wrist, and I was supposed to be in a wheelchair by 2002. And this was already November 2001. I've lived this way for 10 years almost. And um, it was just horrible, you know. Anyway, I went in there, and at the end of the service, the pastor said, if there's anyone here needs prayer for anything, needs to get right with the Lord, come up here. There's people who want to pray with you, pray for you. So I thought, if there's anybody, that's probably me, you know. So I went hobbling up there on my crutches, and I told this guy everything that was going on. And I should, I should add that uh, while this was happening, my, my wife had two diseases and a whole bunch of tumors. And they said after her second surgery that we could never have any children. So she was in a lot of pain and depression. Plus she was dealing with me and out of the hospital all the time trying to kill myself. And on top of that, we were so poor, we only ate about once a week, you know. And uh, so it wasn't too good. <laughs> I weighed 119 pounds. My wife was under 100. We didn't have a car. We didn't have anything. And uh, this guy tells me, he says, you know, it's not enough just to believe in Jesus. The Bible says even the demons in hell believe in Jesus and they tremble. They're not going to go to heaven. And he said, the Bible says you need to repent of your sins, uh, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, be born again. I said, well, I never tried that, dude. <laughs> so he led me in a prayer, Jesus, come into my heart, be my Lord, be my Savior. Thank you for saving me. You know. And he said, could I put my hand on your shoulder? And I said, sure, you know. I thought he was going to go. You'll be all right there, buddy. <laughs> Instead, he put his hand on me and he said, I just pray that you be healed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That your wife come to church with you. She'll get saved. She'll get healed in Jesus' name. Amen. No one thanks, dude. <laughs> Never heard of that before. And I got up in my crutches and I hobbled back to church. The longest I had slept in 10 years was four hours on morphine at the Mayo Clinic. That night I slept for 10 hours with no medication. And, uh, it was a miracle. I, I called my wife. I was still crippled, you know, but I, call, I slept. And I called my wife and I told her, and she said, Oh my gosh, what did they give you? What medicine did you take, you know? So I didn't take any medicine. I just fell asleep without any medicine. I think it was that prayer that got prayed for me yesterday. And she goes, Oh, really? <laughs> Well, that was November 4th, 2001. I started telling people, hey, I got born again, you know. And uh, some people go, huh? <laughs> some people say, oh, praise God, I'm born again too, you know. Hallelujah. Anyways, um, it was all new to me. Never heard of this stuff before. The next month, uh, December 2nd, my wife gave her life to Jesus. And three weeks after that was Christmas Eve. And uh, we prayed all day for $60 to put in the offering for a tithe. And um, it didn't show up. Anyway, we got to the church early to get a good seat. It's a big church. 
and I was sitting in the fifth row and uh, had my crutches laying next to me and uh, waiting for the service to start this man walked up to us I don't know first this woman walked up to us I'm sorry and uh, she said God told me you needed this and she handed me a twenty dollar bill and walked away and I was like what God said you need what you <laughs> know but I looked in my pocket and I had twenty dollars and I said to my wife I said, how much money do you have and she goes uh, twenty four dollars I went oh my gosh oh my gosh that's sixty dollars I prayed all day for sixty dollars you know so we put an envelope, we sealed it, put tithe on it, you know. And I was sitting there thinking what a miracle that was. There's still hardly anybody in the sanctuary just waiting, you know. And uh, this guy walked up to us. And he looks at us and he says, uh, Excuse me, do you two have any kids yet? He said, No, we don't have any kids. And he said, You will. And he's walked away. Whoa. <laughs> I looked at my wife and she was crying. I said, that guy didn't mean to hurt our feelings. He doesn't know we can't have kids. He's trying to be nice because we're new here, you know. And uh, anyway, two weeks later, she told me that she had a dream that we had a baby girl. I told her to stop it. She said, anyway, in the dream, it was a girl. If we ever could have a baby, she said she'd want to name it after her brother Troy that died. She said, but you can't name a girl Troy. I said, try on a faith. You know, but we can't have any kids, so... You gotta shut up about this, you know. We've been through the doctors and the surgeries. It's not possible. Stop it. It's because that guy said it. You're acting crazy, you know. Anyway, five weeks after that, we found out that she was eight weeks pregnant. She had been a week pregnant before the man walked up to us. And we also found out that her diseases and tumors were gone. We were in the hospital and I said, how can this be, you know? Excuse me. How could that happen, you know? And they said, we don't know, but she's pregnant and she's better. I was like, Lord, what are you doing? And we're clearly we're having a miracle. I don't understand why, though. I couldn't sit or stand more than 30 minutes or lift more than 5 pounds for the rest of my life. What are we supposed to do with a baby? How am I supposed to take care of one? What could I possibly do with one? You know. Anyway, a month later, I was at a service and I went up for prayer. And when they prayed for me, I had a vision. And in the vision, I met Jesus. He sat down and talked to me. He told me some things he wants me to do. He ministered to me about forgiveness. It's very important, you know. I didn't know. <laughs> and then he hugged me and kissed me. And I woke up. When I woke up, I wasn't crippled anymore. Um, my back, my neck, my hips, I, I completely vanished. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Um, my skin... Uh, well, my back was constantly bruised for 10 years. I had marked spasms, my entire back, my hips, my neck. It was all black and blue, you know. And when you felt the skin, you could kind of wrap on it. It was hard like Formica. And um, instantly it was soft and pink and there was no bruising or anything. And I, I, could, I could touch my toes. I never could, t you know, get past my knees before. And all of a sudden I could do all this stuff, you know. It was, it was crazy. Anyway, I went... I went home, and when I got home, I was afraid to get out of the car. <laughs> I had certain ways that I had to get in and out of the car, otherwise my, my hips would come out. And so I was like, I'm not going to get out of the car. What if I get out of the car and the pain comes back? I'm just about to sit right here, you know. And I sat there, and uh, after about an hour sitting in the car in the parking garage, I, I read the back of the program from the church, and it said that uh, this man that prayed for me had been healed of incurable head injuries and, and back injuries 20 years ago. And I thought, man, I can get out of the car, you know, if this guy was here for 20, healed for 20 years, I can get out of the car too, you know. So I went upstairs and I woke my wife up and told her and we called my mom and everybody was crying, it was just a mess, you know. It was like, what's happening? And anyway, three weeks later I had a job painting houses. <laughs> and two weeks after that I got to call and cancel my disability. <laughs> The woman on the phone said, you want to cancel your disability? I said, yeah. She said, do you mind if I ask you why? I said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's going to sound kind of strange, but I was healed by God. And I'm not crippled anymore, so I don't need it. Anyways, I was painting houses, and uh, I kept asking the Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm pretty smart. I'm not crippled anymore. And what do you want me to go cure cancer or something, you know? 
And he said, go work at Great Clips. I was like, what? <laughs> I had been trained to, to cut hair, but <laughs> I couldn't do it because I was crippled. And then what, if he's going to send me to Great Clips? How about a fancy place, you know? But it was the Lord, so I went there. And I found out I got to pray with a lot of people while they were getting their hair done. I just talked to people that God says to talk to, say things he says to say. And uh, just an example, um, there was a boy one day, he was 16 years old, and God said, tell him. So I, I told him how I got healed, and my wife got healed, and he said, that's amazing. I said, yeah, it is, it's amazing. He said, my mom's in the hospital dying. I said, what's, what? He said, she's got bleeding on her brain, and we just asked the doctors yesterday if she'd live three more weeks so we could have one more uh, Christmas together. The doctor said, I'm sorry, no, but... She won't. And he said, the whole family started crying. Before I realized what I was saying, I said, boy, you know what? Your mom's not going to die. God's going to heal your mom in the name of Jesus. So as a matter of fact, he's already healed, healed her while we're talking. Amen? He said, amen. I said, you know, the Bible says wherever two agree in one thing in Jesus' name is done. So it's already done. Your mom's already healed. God didn't send you in here today for any haircut. And he said, I could feel that, but I got a good haircut. I said, thanks, man. And uh, a week later, these people came into my work, and this big guy walked up to me, and he said, Are you Jim? I said, Yeah, I'm Jim. He said, You cut my son's hair last week. He's 16 years old. He's got blonde hair. His name is Dane. His mother's in the hospital dying. I said, Yes, sir. I remember Dane. He said, This, this, is, this is his mother. This woman said, Hi. <laughs> And I went, praise Jesus, glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I looked up and this fellow's looking at me like, <laughs> he said, I don't need a haircut, but I'll take one. I said, okay, and I took him back. And while I was cutting his hair, he told me that when his son was not uh, getting his haircut, his mom was having a brain scan. He got done with his haircut. He went home and called his dad at the hospital. And he said, Dad, this guy just cut my hair. He said, Mom's not going to die. God's going to heal her in the name of Jesus. And he already healed her while we were talking. She was already better. And he said, what? He said, Dane, we just came out of the brain scan. It's not there anymore. And they let her out of the hospital that day. And I said, praise Jesus. And he said, this is too many coincidences. Where do you start with all this? So it's really simple. You ask Jesus in your heart. You make him your Lord and Savior. And he hadn't done that, so I ended up praying with him and his wife to get born again. And uh, my daughter, Triana Faith Cooper, is uh, five now. My son, Caleb James, uh, just turned four last uh, couple weeks ago. And, uh, you know, we just go where God tells us to go and we do what he tells us to do. We go pray for people and we live by what he provides us. And uh, he's really good. He's been really good to us. I just want to thank Jesus right now for everybody. Thank you, Father, for what you've done for me. I love you. God bless you. Lord, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Jesus.